sitting here with my mic muted. Forgive me. Welcome to the show, ladies and gentlemen. The Messages of Inspiration and Hope is probably brought to you by the good guys at the 6 webinarcom We got a couple of ladies on the show today. One's a reverend, Cheryl Sosnowski. She is going to go into about metaphysical, how we get out of the physical, get into the metaphysical, and get into the life of love and abundance and the things that hold us back. Also a good friend of mine, Annalyn Scott. This lady is tremendous. Her and her husband went through, a, a, her husband have had kidney failure, and they they created the one in nine charities because one in nine people do not know about that they have, uh, there's kidney failure in one in nine. But we'll be right back with Cheryl right after this brief message from our sponsor. Hi, and welcome to the Messages of Inspiration and Hope show that's proudly sponsored by the 6-Minute Webinar. Today, we have some exciting and very interesting guests, real people just like you and me. Thank you for tuning in. Enjoy the show. Now, here's Jim. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to bring Cheryl to the stage. And Cheryl, how are you today? Can fabulous. you hear me? Yes, oh, I can. Good I'm deal. Fabulous. Beautiful day. Good deal. It's so good to have you here on the show. And uh, you are a reverend, aren't you? I am. Yes, I am. Yeah. I tell you, and you're in the world of metaphysical, uh, teaching people about metaphysical and all that. Yeah, I do. I work well. I've got my, um, I'm an actual literal minister. So I am a reverend and I work with people and do spiritual, it's called spiritual mind treatments. And so it's Mm -hmm. really based on the philosophy of the old school, um, early 1900 spiritual teachers like Ernest Holmes and Mm -hmm. um, all of that generation that first started really teaching over a hundred years ago about the law of attraction, about how Mm -hmm. our thoughts become things. Um, And so it's really a very old science and it's now just now starting to be proven by quantum science that oh like oh wow maybe there's something to this so yes i love yeah. it there really is because uh, one of our uh, people i'm associated with the co-creator of the six minute webinar mr bill heinrich he he teaches a lot about that it took him about 25 years to write this book and he teaches people when you get out of the physical you get out of the area of need and want and all that. And that's exactly what you're talking about. Cause we're not supposed to live in fear. Are we? No, when you're, when you're stuck in fear, well, number one, fear also, um, increases your stress hormones and makes you sick and keeps you stuck. But from a metaphysical standpoint, fear just attracts more of what you're fearing to you because the Mm -hmm. universe doesn't know the difference. It doesn't negate what you're saying. And so if you're constantly focusing on what you're, what you're fearing and what you don't want to create, you start attracting those kinds of situations over and over into your life because Mm -hmm. that's what your energy is focused on. It's an energetic um, request. Yeah. It's kind of like your mind is kind of like the, your garden in a way. It doesn't matter what you plant, whatever you plant, it's going to grow. It's up to you to make the decision on what you want planted there. And the mind is one thing that we are in control of, even though sometimes we think we're, we're out of control, you know, (laughs) but we feel that way anyway. Yeah, exactly. And it's, I'm also a mindfulness trainer and I'm a trained mindfulness trainer through UCLA. And so I understand the neuroscience and it actually started with this whole neuroscience journey of wanting to understand the brain and why does it work this way? And how come, how come I stay, you know, why do I focus on the things I don't want? And how do I get out of this habit loop, this habit thinking and um, learning those tricks and how to do that and how to stay present so that you can become aware of what you're thinking about and they're very subtle, these thoughts. And they're, you're, you know, our mind's job is to constantly tell us a story about ourselves. And that's what it's doing all day long. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, most people are stuck in the same thoughts they had yesterday. You have these habit thoughts that just repeat over and over again, day after day. And mm-hmm. you're not really aware. And you start, um, you know, people respond and start reacting to everything they're thinking as if they're being told what to do by their own mind instead of talking to themselves and controlling their mind and what Mm -hmm. they're thinking. Yeah. Yeah, Because the mind can only bring up what you've already done or it's in the past. And uh, if you, that's that sometimes looking in the rear view mirror can be a good thing. And sometimes it'd be a bad thing, you know, but there's some people that just, they 
let their minds control them to the point of just attracting more negativeness. Yeah. And, and yeah. that's that really uh, robs them of all the riches of life, you know, their health their happiness, everything, the things that money can't buy. Because, yeah. you know, we, we talked right before the show, I mentioned on a previous show that the things that we value in life sometimes is what we can buy with money. Mm -hmm. And that's really pitiful, isn't it, Cheryl? Well, it's just such a shallow way to live your life. And we, anybody who's been in that, I mean, we all, we all do that because we live on this planet and we get stuck in that, that loop until you realize that there's just never enough. You can never have enough stuff. There's always oh, something yeah. better. There's always, and in Buddhism and the Buddhism philosophy, they call it chasing the hungry, hungry ghost that it can never be full. You can <laughs> never satisfy it ever, ever, ever with stuff. And so that's when you start to turn inward and look at this create this spaciousness that's inside of you to grow. And um, that's what I help people to do. And I do it with alternative forms of meditation. So it starts, but for me, meditation is the foundation because you can't mm -hmm. change your thoughts if you don't know what the heck you're thinking. Right. So, Oh yeah. Yeah. So I do it with art and with sound healing are the forms yeah. of meditation that I use with people. Yeah. You mentioned that earlier. I'm right before they went live here on the broadcast that you hear heal by sound. I mean, yes. explain that a little bit. I'm kind of curious about that. Is that the, the big boom box and all that? No, 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 no. I use <laughs> um, right behind me to see my collection of crystal alchemy bowls. I have a few here. So I use bowls. I use chimes, bells, um, Tibetan bowls, the metal bowls, drums. So depending on what the person has going on, but we're all, everything in your body, everything in the universe is just a frequency and a vibration. Mm -hmm. Sound is frequency and vibration. And so when you, these patterns that we have in our bodies get stuck, so you have these stuck patterns and you can break up the patterns with sound. And so it's absolutely magical and powerful what sound does to the body and to the brain, instantly putting your body into a state of your brain into a state of entrainment and your body is made mostly of water. Mm -hmm. And so water is an excellent conductor of vibration. And so if you think mm -hmm. about that, the vibrations of sound are going all through your body mm -hmm. and it's so amazingly wonderful for your body. And you can understand and tune into the frequencies of um, specific things of stress, of muscle tension, of all these different mm -hmm. things carry a frequency and you can, treat them with actual sound frequencies to help break up those stuck patterns. So it's a really yeah. powerful and easy way for people to relax their bodies and relax their minds instantly. Exactly. As you were talking about that, reminded me of a time I was over at uh, one of my wife's relatives house and they had this little waterfall there in the room and I laid down on the couch and all I heard was just the water trickling down and it put yes. me right out. I mean, I just, Took an afternoon nap and I felt, you know, felt really good too. But that's that's what it reminded me in my mind. And that's the type of sound therapy you're you're talking about, huh? Absolutely. So the sounds of nature, human beings love our bodies respond to those sounds of nature, to the sounds oh, of yeah. rain, to the sounds of the ocean, to the sound of winds in the trees. And the reason why is that they are frequencies that don't end themselves. They just continue. Mm. They go on and on and on and they don't have an end. And so our bodies pick those up and we find them to be very relaxing oh, yeah. and they instantly help you to relax. Putting, I have a fountain also in my room. I love to go to sleep to the sound of the water and the white oh, noise yeah. and it's very relaxing. Oh, it really is. And you know, when you were talking about rain and stuff, when I lived in Arizona, I mean, the smell of rain, I mean, people that, you know, that live, you know, on the East Coast, they don't understand that. But the smell of the rain is all oh, it's just that's a smell that never, ever, ever gets old. doesn't it? Yeah, I love the smell of rain. Oh. The smell of the rain is called petrichor. Is so it? it is. And it, I looked that up because I was curious because like, there has to be a word for this for this smell and the word is petrichor and it's really such a beautiful word to um capture that essence and i do i love the smell of the rain especially in the desert i love living in the oh. desert oh yeah would you be kind enough to spell that petro what that word it's was p-e-t-r-i-c-h-o-r <laughs> okay yeah i gotta look that up because i guess i never thought about it, but yeah they would be a word for the smell of rain it makes sense <laughs> But it's it's amazing that, you know, all the work that you do and I want to ask you something. Uh, what really was the motivation behind you, you know, saying this is the path I'm going to take? How did that all come about? 
Well, it came about from having my own version of a stress induced breakdown that led me to mindfulness practice. And um, luckily, I had a friend who recognized the symptoms and what was going on with me and the stress level that I was having. And uh, I took a mindfulness class and I've always been an artist. And so um, I found diff meditating really difficult, even though I stuck with it and I was dedicated to do it. I also mm -hmm. discovered, though, that painting and meditation go together beautifully. It instantly sh shuts off your mind. It puts you into that state of flow mm -hmm. um, and it's very relaxing. And so I came up with a way that I'm like, well, maybe I can meditate alter like an alternative form of meditation with painting. And so I created that mm -hmm. and that led to sound and um, I've always loved sound and music. I grew up in a musical family and I've always loved to dance. And mm -hmm. I just started researching with this when COVID happened. I was like, this is my opportunity now. I have all this time that I could finally dive in and study and learn all that I can about the effects of sound on the human body. And so that's what I've been doing this whole time that we've oh, been. Yeah. yeah. And it's just, um, it's profound and it's amazing. And so that's what led me to it is my, my search for my own healing first. And then mm. once I found it that I was like, wow, if I can feel this way and if I can heal and come from a place of so being so dark and so hopeless and in such despair that I feel like it's my job to help other people oh, yeah. um, be able to tap into their own light and find that inside themselves again. You're exactly right. Cause that's one of the things that we inspire people to do is Take your God-given natural gifts and refine those and then reach out and help others because there is room for everybody to reach yeah. out and help someone. Mm -hmm. I mean, there really is. And if you got a gift, I mean, you you should, you, you owe it. it. That is your job. It really is. Yeah. And even on Facebook here, I've got to talk about, you You do, I'm going to let you talk about this, your lessonsofmastery.com, that's on a Zoom, is that correct? I do do it on Zoom, and I do it on Sunday mornings, and so um, the, there's a book called The Way of Mastery, and it was a book that was recommended to me by a coach about a year and a half ago, and um, it was the book that completely transformed my own spirituality and my own mm -hmm. view of myself. Um and my own level of personal responsibility and finding that that with that personal responsibility comes an immense freedom and an immense peace. And so mm. I facilitate classes based on that book where we all read it together on Sunday mornings in a group. And it's just a powerful, spiritual, beautiful group of people that we just all get together and we all read and then we reflect on what it meant to us or how we see it applies in our lives. And mm. Um, it's my service of the world to the world as a reverend. It's the book I love to teach from just because it's such a profound book. And mm. yeah, it's on lessonsofmastery.com and the schedule's there. It's every Sunday at 10 o'clock in the morning, Arizona time. And there's a Zoom link there. Yeah. As folks keep in mind, Arizona time, Arizona is one of the states that doesn't change time. So right Correct. now they're on mountain time, but during daylight savings time, they have to go on Pacific time. So Correct. you might want to make a note of that. And, you know, one of the things that uh, I like to ask people, my guests, when they're here is, um, you know, share a little bit about, you know, what made you you. In other words, you know, in your in your life growing up, you know, because we're all, you know, we're all shaped by experiences, good or bad, good and bad, I should say. And uh, if you'd like to share some of that with the audience, I'm sure they'd love to hear it. Mm, well, <laughs> um, well, I grew up in Southern California in a very small town and I had a lot of freedom when I was a child. And it was my saving grace because I also grew up in a very abusive home. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to have my freedom and my outside um, being in nature to really escape and use my imagination and um you know, when I was a little girl, I used to always love to play church and I would create rituals. So I've always had this very spiritual aspect of my of myself. And then um, as a teenager, I actually lived on the streets as a runaway for many years in wow. Southern California, in and out of foster homes and group homes until I was emancipated. And so and I share this story because people meeting me would never know that they would never, mm -hmm. ever think that. And the reason that I do share it is, and I'm very honest and transparent about it, it's because, again, there's, it made me who I am because it made me strong. It made me very compassionate, very empathetic, mm -hmm. very curious about people. So when I meet somebody, I, I don't, I, 
I don't automatically slip into judgment. I slip into curiosity and I wonder what their story is because you never know. And um, I've met some very interesting people that way. And it's made me very strong and it's made me have a lot of faith in my creator and mm -hmm. um, in everything that I do and in my love of people and in my love of seeing the miracle and the magic um, mm -hmm. that we all are that I just love so much. And I love, um, you know, I love myself and I love sharing my light oh. with people and I love lighting up people to share themselves yeah. too. And I always tell people, if I can do it coming from where I came from, anybody can. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Cause that's the first point that everyone should start. They got to love themselves first. Cause once you love yourself, then you can, you can only share what you got. Yes. And uh, once you love yourself, you learn how to love others. And uh, when you, when you're doing just that, you're on the road to success. You really truly are. Yeah. And as you were talking, I'm going to share a little story out of school. I was speaking in front of a group of people that we were, we all knew each other. And it was Mother's Day. And I just want to say, just want to wish all the mothers out there a very happy Mother's Day. You're very special in our life, all those things. And I says, you know, mothers really build character, don't they? I look at all these characters in here, you know. <laughs> but, you know, it was a good icebreaker to get, get it going. But, you know, in, you have a Facebook group. Is that right? I have a couple of Facebook groups. Yes. Okay. Please share that with us. Yeah. So my, um, I have a Facebook group called Creative Women of Facebook um, that's on Facebook. And that's actually the biggest one that I have that I share a lot of information in. And I'm trying to get less and less. I'm trying to be more and more off of social media and more and more engaged in um one-on-one -on -one, small groups. Um, it's more intimate and more connecting. And I feel like the connections are just so important right now with people. And so um, I'm kind of doing the opposite and pulling away from social media <laughs> instead of moving into more social media. I know what you mean, because one of the things that I've been trying to get away from is, you know, less and less Facebook. And then someone will say, you know, didn't you get my message? And I, no, I didn't. Well, I sent it to you on Messenger. I'm going like, <laughs> I'm trying to lean off of Facebook and you let me go back to Facebook. I mean, that's, uh, you know, that's not good. <laughs> oh, I know. And when, when my phone started telling me how much time I spend on social media, you know, how it breaks, oh. it compartmentalizes and tells you, yeah. I was like, Oh, that is way too much life spent with a oh, screen. Yeah. In my face. And I don't like that. So, Oh yeah. That's yeah. a wake up call, isn't it? It really is. And it's another addiction. It's another escape. Mm. And, um, you know, there's a practice I do driving. I live in Phoenix and I'm, you notice when you come to red lights, everybody picks up their phone and they start like, I have to see what's happening between my last red light and this red light. Something important must, must have happened or they're so bored. They got to fill that time constantly. Mm -hmm. And I sit at red lights and I do a practice where I send loving kindness to all the cars around me, to all the people around me and wish that they get where they're going safely and oh, yeah. they get home to their families safely and their loved ones safely. And, um, it's my own private little practice I do while I drive around Phoenix and beaming people up while they're sitting there looking at their phones. And so my challenge is for people as a mindfulness practice, don't check your phone at red lights. What if instead you sit and, and send well wishes to the people around you that you don't even know? It's oh, very, yeah. It feels good. It feels good. We, we develop a lot of bad habits very easily. And, you know, the thing that really gets me uh, is that, you know, I get ready to go somewhere. In fact, I got to hop in my truck and after the show and take off and do a little errand. But if, uh, if I just going to go uptown and I leave the driveway and I forgot my cell phone, oh my gosh, I got to turn around and get my cell phone, you know, kind of like, <laughs> geez, <clears throat> years ago, we didn't have cell phones. I used to drive across country and everything, call in tonight when I get somewhere. If I didn't call in that night, well, I guess he didn't make it. <laughs> <laughs> You know, there's something to be said about not being available 24 seven on your oh, phone. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. I tell you, it's, I, I screen a lot of my calls because I, most of the things I get are, you know, people trying to sell me something or you know, get something for nothing, you know, mm -hmm. and it's, it's just really been such a nuisance that sometimes I just cut my phone off and I tell people just send me a message or not, I'm not a message, but a send me an email because I'm on my laptop and, that way I can you know, I'll respond to you. But to my goodness, you know, when I when I think about you and how the things you went through in your life, it made you you and how you just really says you embraced it. You embraced the the challenges that you faced, didn't you? Um, not when I was younger, I didn't. Yeah, there was I know. A lot of 
you know, there was a lot of, um, of denial. And mm -hmm. in my 20s, I was the, I lived that um, perfectionist fake role. So it was always mm -hmm. fake, but I was, I had this pretend facade and I, there was nothing authentic about me, nothing. And I wouldn't, mm -hmm. I didn't even have any close friends because I didn't want anybody to know me and know my past and mm -hmm. know the truth. And um, it's really interesting when you start working on the inside of you, everything changes on the outside of you. And um, mm -hmm. now I just have the most profound, most beautiful friendships you could ever want, a person oh, could yeah. ever want. I'm so grateful all the time. And, um, you know, and it's really about getting to know yourself, getting to know who mm -hmm. you are. And part of that is unplugging from these devices. And um, this it keeps your mind busy. And so every morning when I wake up, I start my morning. I have a morning routine like a, like a lot of people do. And I get myself one cup of coffee. I sit down. I do my morning reading. And then I meditate. And I do it every morning. And I've noticed that on the mornings where I will occasionally slip and um, I'll see an alert on Facebook or something and on my phone and I'll click on it and I'll go into Facebook immediately or Instagram or whatever first. I notice um, kind of a numbness that happens to my mind that does mm. that's not that wasn't there before I did it. And so it's very it's something that I've noticed about myself that happens. And so I've definitely made it a very diligent practice to not have my phone in the morning or not check social media in the morning. I listen to listen to music while I'm meditating. And, you know, it's just so important. And I have my teenagers unplug on Sundays. We like to go off roading. We have a Jeep. And so we like to go out into the mountains and the wilderness mm. here in Arizona. And we have a no phones for a day rule and you can mm. do it until we get home. And, you know, it's, it's something that they actually look forward to and um, enjoy. It's it, just yeah. to relax and be in nature and, um, we went, my mom rented a place for Thanksgiving up in, um, oh, what was that place called? It's up in a Greer in Arizona. And I'd never been no. up there. Before. Absolutely mm -hmm. beautiful. Mm -hmm. No Wi-Fi, no phone reception. And so my son was like, no phone. There's no, what are we going to do for days, mom? We're, we're only there for like two days. And I said, hey, welcome to the 80s, kid. We're going to have to make up games like we had to do when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. So we wound up having so much fun just throwing rocks who could throw a rock the farthest and who could throw a stick the farthest just these silly things that wound up being so much fun we had a great time oh yeah i remember as a kid growing up on a farm in north carolina you know we we'd take bricks and just any type of little things we get our hands on and our bricks was a bulldozer we could make roads you know exactly. on the dirt and all that and it really creates uh, an opportunity to have a very creative mind and yes. be able to more so than just be dumbed down and i understand what you're talking about there you're just dumbed down and just going through you may be kids nowadays are very quick on computers and stuff yes right right but, you know, a lot of things you know outside of that world it, you know they just they lack they really do it's it's they yeah. just it's a huge injustice to them yeah the creative the creative freedom and the play and just using your imagination and using and you know using your um the, your common sense right and just oh, yeah. growing up in the wilderness and in the mountains where i did as a kid and having the wilderness and nature be my saving grace that i could go escape into mm -hmm. i really constantly used my imagination and learned survival techniques and learned, you know, just what, what kind of berries can I eat? What can't I eat? And, and not by trying them, of course, but by oh, asking, yeah. looking at the animals and you know, like those kinds of things. And it's just using your imagination is really powerful. And it comes in handy as an adult that we can, I'm a, I am a very fast thinker and an outside of the box thinker that I can come up with alternative <laughs> solutions to problems really fast. I hear you. You also, you have a podcast, don't you? I do. Yeah. Let's hear I do. about that. Uh, my podcast is The Powerful Creator Show, and I interview people who are powerful creators who are creating lives and businesses they love and take responsibility for their lives and um, are stepping into this role of, ooh, what can I do? What can I create? What can I make? Mm. How can I show up? And I really believe that our the purpose of life is not what you get and not what your job is, but who you're here to be. And I feel like wow. that's a different, that's a different space. How could someone find your podcast? Uh, do you do it Facebook live on, or how do you do that? I actually, you can find it on every major podcasting network. It's the powerful creator show. It's on iTunes. It's on okay. Spotify. It's on everything. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. also do, do the videos on my website and on Facebook and on YouTube. 
Um, and they can find it on my um, createspacestudio.com. There's a link to my podcast on there if anybody would like to apply and think they'd be an interesting guest. I'm always looking for wonderful, amazing people to oh, talk yeah. to. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So they just, if someone is out there and they would want to do that, they just get in touch with you right here at your email address? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. yeah, we have a we have a radio show, and we're on uh, iHeart Radio, Spotify, all yeah. those things. Yeah. It, it's really neat, isn't it? It is. It's amazing. And so, the, like, I it's this like we were talking about earlier with our phones and the technology. There's a balance, and I don't hate technology. I love technology. I love that I can hop on a call with someone in India and sit here and look at them, or you're where you are, and I can sit and look mm -hmm. at you. It's amazing, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it's I I really do love it. And but then I think there's that balance of also unplugging unplug your phone so you can plug into yourself i think that's so important yeah we're going to be coming out to the phoenix area next year and uh marty haggard's a good friend of mine he's he's coming out he's going to put on a, a show and all and we're going to get get together and have a little shindig together so we'll we'll make sure we invite you there oh please absolutely yeah, yeah. and bring some holy water since you're a reverend okay <laughs> <laughs> i have have some in my office back there so i can do that <laughs> i hear you i hear i had to tease you about that i had to tease you but i, I tell you we got about one minute or actually a couple minutes left would you like to just share anything you'd like with the audience out there i mean you're a wonderful lady i mean you got a lot of to offer and just any closing thoughts that you'd like to share please do thank you i would just like to tell people my favorite thing that I tell everybody is to have the courage to dare to be divine. And that's mm. really how I word it is stepping into this space and this acknowledgement that we are galactic citizens on spaceship earth. That's how I look at it. I'm like, this is my, this is my spacesuit, this outfit that I wear, this body that I'm in, but I'm consciousness. We're all consciousness and we're mm. all part of the same consciousness that creates the mountains and the trees and the animals and the flowers and these beautiful, just the beauty and the mirror, the miraculous place that we live on is just so beautiful. And just to remind everybody that there's this beautiful divine spark in all of us that's there mm -hmm. and to tap into it and to feel it and to know that it's there. And you know, it's that, it's that pulse that drives you, that wants you to express yourself and it's really this feeling of of a of a drive of a push of a of mm -hmm. something that wants you to express and um i came to discover that this perfectionistic tendency that i used to have mm -hmm. is really that exact divine spark that perfection is nothing but perfection in pursuit of itself there's nowhere yeah. to get to it's actually <laughs> just an energy it's a sense mm -hmm. of a a sense of a drive it's what drives you and so for me it's that divine spark and reminding people that they also have that divine spark in them sure sure the one thing i've noticed about you during the entire um interview here is the fact how your lights they're in your eyes and how the energy is flowing out because uh it, it just resonates across the the airway here i mean across the the broadcast you people can see it oh, and they can, they can see that you're the real deal and i salute you on that i really do Thank you, Jim, very much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Took a lot well, of work. Thank here, you. So I really appreciate that. Thank oh, I understand. You. I understand. I appreciate that very much, what you've done and what you're doing for others. And ladies and gentlemen, please get in touch with Cheryl there. Your email address is there. Cheryl at creativespacestudio.com. She'll be glad to get in touch with you and be sure and catch your own lessons of mastery.com on Zoom there and just, you know, if you have any need or just want to talk to her, please get in touch with her because this young lady, uh, she can help you. There's no question about that. If you're living in fear or if you feel like you've been enslaved on the inside mm -hmm. and you're looking for that key to unlock that lock, give her a call. Yeah. <laughs> yes. thank you. Cheryl, thank you so much for being with us today. We really, you really blessed our, our show. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. I was so grateful to be here. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we just got to take a quick little break here for just a moment here. I got to play another commercial here and pay a bill. We'll be right back right after this brief message with Anna Lynn. Hi, I'm Angel Marie Monticelli with Angel Marie Shines. And I had the pleasure, oh, the honor to go through training for the six minute webinar. Oh my gosh. This webinar 
and how it's structured and how they teach it. Thank you, Speakers Pathway Coalition. Thank you, Don McGrath and the whole team for the six minute webinar, because you made it so simple, easy. And the way you lined it out with the outline, I can reproduce it and reproduce it. And I'm already getting the engagement. I'm getting people that are coming back that are saying, oh, I love this webinar that's so short, so to the point, and I love your products and what I'm selling, but then what I'm also, the services that I provide, and I do for any of this because I have the framework. So thank you so much to the whole team because the six minute webinar totally rocks. Thank you. Oh, welcome back to the show, ladies and gentlemen. Our next guest is a good friend of mine, and we've had her on uh, the radio show as well, and we're so honored to have her fill in for us on a very short notice today because I just called her last night. We had a cancellation, but Anna Lynn Scott, thank you so much for filling in for us, you know, helping us with our show today. Welcome to the show. The very first time I heard you speak, it was at one of our little events, in Phoenix, and I'm standing there and I'm going like, holy smokes. I went around the room because you were standing in the front. I wasn't going to walk behind you on the stage. I went around the room to Don and I said, Don, we got to get her on the radio. He says, absolutely. So we got you on the radio. We got the chance to meet your wonderful husband, Raymond, super nice guy. And I'm going to let you uh, just introduce yourself briefly. Then I want you to tell Raymond's story. Ladies and gentlemen, this is interesting. Trust me on that. So please go right ahead. All right. Um, well, I am wearing several different hats. Um, I'm a wife, as you've, as you've already explained, a mother, an author, creator, um, a solution provider at heart. And um, actually, my husband, Raymond, and I, are the founders of One in Nine, the nonprofit organization raising awareness for kidney disease because it hits so close to home for us. And um, we started about five years ago. And um, but that's not where our story started with this with this journey. It started coming up on actually we met 23 years ago, and three months into our dating relationship, Raymond's kidney failed at the age of 29 you know, out of the blue, he was a year out of the, he was a year out of the military, thought he was, you know, six foot tall and bulletproof and um, really took us by surprise. And so um, that's how our relationship started, but he had already had those three months to show me what a great guy he was. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's interesting because when, when his kidney failed, it was, like I said, out of the blue, he knew that he had high blood pressure, which is the second leading cause of kidney disease. And Jim, we didn't learn that that was the second leading cause until many, many years later, which is kind of why we're doing what we're doing. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And it really, um, you know, when the doctor came in and said, because um, he didn't have symptoms, he had high blood pressure, was taking medication, but um, didn't recognize, wasn't checking it regularly. And so didn't mm -hmm. know that it was so elevated. And when he went into urgent care thinking that he had bronchitis, um, the, the nurse took his blood pressure and ran for the doctor. She took it three times. It was 270 over 190. Whoa. And so, yeah, they That's... took him to the hospital. And by then it was like 300 over 200. And the doctor came in and told him, your kidneys have failed. Wow. He said, what? What does this mean? What? We need yeah. to start you on dialysis today. I never heard, he had never heard of dialysis, didn't know what that was. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, he was in the hospital for about a week. And when I came to pick him up and take him home, he turned to me and, and said, you know, I, I think I'm going to move back home to Charleston, South mm -hmm. Carolina, where he's from. And I said, why? And he said, I, I have I know that um, I have a long road ahead of me and you're too young to have to deal with this. He was 29. I was 23 at the time. And he said, this just wouldn't be fair to you. And I looked at him and I said, you're a good man. You don't need to go anywhere. I'm not going to mm -hmm. break up with you because of this. Let's just see where our relationship is going to go. And mm -hmm. we were married a year later. <laughs> yeah. 
And after I met him, I, you know, you're right. Raymond is just a wonderful guy. And it's really amazing that it shows a lot of maturity on his part, too, because he figured, wow, here I got this, you know, problem that's going to be with me, you know, and I don't want to burden this young lady here. And and you just kind of like say, hey, <laughs> we're just going to take it. We're just going to roll with the flow. And that's exactly what you did. And you guys created the one in nine charities. And uh, you came up with that nine with that name. Let me say when I heard when how you came up with that name, I was standing over there. And I'm going like, holy smokes, because most people don't have a clue about that one in nine. Would you go into that a little bit? Oh yeah, they they have no you know no no clue about it. Um, you know, so at the time when because here we had gone through this gym for seventeen years, all the twists and turns of Raymond's help, but we had never re really been engaged with any kidney organizations or really heard much about the stats other than what Raymond was dealing with. So when I heard five years ago that twenty six million Americans or one in nine adults have kidney disease and 90% don't even know it. Yeah. It's like that completely unacceptable. That was Raymond. Raymond fell into that 90%, mm -hmm. you know, all those years ago. And the sad part about it is there's still, here we are five years later, there's still, you know, 90% of the people with it are walking around not knowing. Unfortunately, Jim is no longer 26 million. It's 37 million Americans. Wow. In just five years, it's, it's jumped up that much. And so the statistics now, one in three are at risk. Um, and and it's, it's just unacceptable. Um, diabetes and high blood pressure are the two leading causes by far. So as we're seeing diabetes and pre-diabetes on the rise like crazy, what do you think is happening to kidney disease? It's going up. It's going up. Yeah, absolutely. And so most people don't, they don't, they don't think about it. And, you know, we didn't think about it. And even we were mm -hmm. going through it, you know, yes, we're dealing with it personally, but it just isn't, it's not a sexy disease. Right. And, yeah. you know, my mother's a, a breast cancer survivor. So most people know someone with breast cancer. Um, probably a lot of people, they'll know someone with kidney disease. They may just not know that they have kidney disease. But yeah. if you were to ask a five-year-old, what does the pink ribbon stand for? Oh, They're yeah. going to know breast cancer, but you could ask any adult about kidney disease and they'd be hard pressed to give you any fact about it. So I think it's just, it's really time to sound an alarm and not to have people be in fear, but for people to be informed and to yeah. be aware and to make sure that they are their own biggest advocate, yeah. not only for their kidney health, but for their overall health. And I don't know about you, Jim, but if 2020 hasn't taught us anything else, mm. our health is paramount. That is like, Ooh, yeah. and the people we serve, many of them are being impacted right now in 2020 because they have compromised immune system. They have these comorbidities and things. And so mm -hmm. we just, you know, it, it's time to sound that alarm in general for all of us. Yeah, it really is. And when someone goes to your website, one in nine uh, charities there, the it's one in nine kidney challenge dot com. What would they see there? What would be some kind of inf what's the information that they could pick up and learn about the kidney disease? So they're, they're going to have some resources there. They have a little bit more information. In fact, they can also pick up our book. One in nine tribe, if they would like, that's also available mm -hmm. on Amazon. And, um, there's more. We're, we're going to be updating the site, too. We also keep pretty up to date on Facebook. Mm -hmm. The same thing, just one in nine kidney challenge. And um, we're, we're also getting ready to launch our documentary. So stay yeah. tuned on that because that is a huge resource. This has been a labor of love. Mm. and something that really was the catalyst of us starting one in nine mm -hmm. was this vision I had of this documentary. And then it was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is so much bigger than just a documentary. <laughs> this is our purpose and, and our mission. And, and so I'm really excited that we've completed our documentary, A Dance with Destiny. And we'll be oh, premiering man. that in early 2021. And we'll also be doing some virtual screenings um, on our site and with some key partners of ours. So, um, when we'll be updating, you know, again, there's as, as these um, with different resources that we're going to have available for people, 
some questions to be able to ask their doctor, right? What, and yeah. what are the, the main risk factors mm-hmm. that, um, that are tied to kidney disease? So just to really empower people and help them to become their biggest advocates. Absolutely. You mentioned about the dance there and what came to my mind is uh, dancing with the stars and Raymond was on there. It was the Arizona version for the kidney foundation. And you, you said he, he did, was the jive he was doing there. I think it was. It, wasn't it? it was. He, he danced the jive yeah. to um, Pharrell's happy. How fitting. Wow. That's really amazing. Yeah. If, if they go to your website, would they have the, there's a video there. I didn't get a chance to look. No, at it. it's not there. I do have it on our YouTube there. channel. I do have it on our YouTube channel, but they'll be able to see it in the documentary too. So oh, okay. That's cool. uh, it truly has been a dance with destiny. Oh yeah. It really the has. Fact that he was able to dance February 20th, 2016 as a dialysis patient. You know, we, we do his dialysis treatments, as you know, five days a week here oh, from yeah. our home. Yeah. And we've been doing that for the last eight years. And that really helped. It, it, it's so much better on his health, his heart, gives him more stamina. So he was the first celebrity star dancer who was actively on dialysis. And the night he danced was 18 years to the exact day that his kidneys failed. We had a lot to be happy about. Wow, no kidding. No kidding, because you think about that day when his kidneys fell and probably felt like his world was crashing. And if someone would have told him 18 years from this very day, you're going to be on TV dancing with the stars and all that. They'd, he'd probably said, get out of my get out of here. I don't even want to hear that. that. That's not on his radar at all. He couldn't be able to process that, could he? No, 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 yeah. not at all. If you would have told me 18 years ago that we'd be sitting here having this conversation and yeah. the movie never would have guessed it. Mm-hmm. You know, the thing I like about your mission there, how you and Raymond come together as a team, you work together as a team. You got it. You know, obviously uh, you're very well versed in, and knowledgeable of this disease. But there has been a lot of people that you've been able to reach out and help and other people that suffer from kidney disease. And you build a like a little tribe there for them, don't you? Mm hmm. We, we do. Um, and it really, you know, you hear, you hear the, uh, the African proverb that it takes a village to raise a child. Well, it really takes a village <laughs> to, to take care of anyone with, you know, kidney disease or any chronic illness. And so, you know, having our tribe, and, and that doesn't mean people that just have kidney disease. You know, our tribe consists of, of some wonderful doctors who are in this mm-hmm. fight, um, family members who are in this fight, um, just supporters and people who, you know, don't want to fall into that or want to want want to help others to a- avoid this this type of a journey. And so our tribe is beautiful. It's absolutely just diverse. Uh, it, you know, we, we have people from all across the country, people in different parts of the world, and um, we're we're all really coming together and beating our drum mm-hmm. um, of, of hope and change to oh, to bring the awareness and help with prevention and you know help help other lives. Yeah, help people get knowledge too, because you bring a tribe like that together with all those people, the energy just goes right up through the roof. It just really wow. does. It's it's a it's a physical as well as a mental mastermind. It really is. And you feel it, don't you? Oh, absolutely. It's so rewarding. And and to, you know, meet people with such amazing stories, people that have defeated the odds, you know, mm-hmm. defied odds like Raymond has, people that that um you know, have had situations even much worse than Raymond and make us look and like say, wow, we really have to count our blessings. And, Mm -hmm. and to see even young children who, you know, had to be on dialysis, never had kidney function, even from day one. And that, that type of a journey, um, you know, it's just, it's incredible. It's giving me goosebumps right now, you know, thinking about it. And then it can, it can touch people. doesn't matter what your, you know, how much money you have in the bank account. It, it doesn't matter which, you know, what part of town you live in. It doesn't matter what part of the country, you know, it can affect so many different people. And um, we're all kind of in this, in this together. And, but, but the stories, you know, the, the strength of some of these people and, and just their, their drive, because it can be kidney disease, especially in kidney failure. It It's very difficult people are mm. very tired there um it's it takes such a toll on just your entire life 
And you may not see it all the way, you know, from the outside, but the way they feel on the inside and, and depression even comes with that. And so to, oh, to see that side, you know, people who have really been impacted and, and unfortunately even people have, you know, given up. And, and I've seen some people or heard of people that have given up and their family members said, oh my goodness, if I would have known that, you know, this home dialysis was available, or if I would have known these things, if they would have known, I think they would still be here. Yeah. Um, and so that there's, you know, it's a silent disease because there really aren't many symptoms, but then it's also a silent disease because people aren't talking about it. So, yeah. Well, when you talked about his blood pressure being that high and his kidneys fell and they got him on dialysis, I mean, poor Raymond. Um, does he ever share what went through his mind at that moment? It had to be, you know, just shattering. I mean, just absolutely. That's, that's like being body slammed in life. I mean. Mm -hmm. You know, it's because goodness. He's yeah, yeah, he did. He was, I mean, 29. Yeah, right? I know. He's 29 years of age. Been a, he, was, he was in the Army, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. he was in the Army. Yeah. So you know, healthy. And um, he did. He shared that, you know, when the doctor came in and told him that his kidneys failed and that he was going to have to start dialysis that day, he was like, what the hell is dialysis? <laughs> I don't know what, what is that, first of all? Mm -hmm. And then the thought, you know, he said after that, he was he couldn't really hear what the doctor was saying. It was like that, wah, 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 wah. And what was going through his mind was, how long do I have to live? Wow. So maybe part of the saving grace of some of that ignorance was he didn't know that the statistic was that the average life life expectancy of someone on dialysis is five years. Mm, he far exceeded yeah. that, and you know, it does depend on the person's health and other other factors. Um, but it, yeah, he, he wasn't sure what, what was next. Um, no. but he does also say, um, in fact, when he, uh, you know, when, when he tried to give me that out, you know, he said, I hope that you would stay, but, but I did, I had, I had to give you that out. I didn't think it would be fair sure. to, you. He said, but I was hoping that you would, that you wouldn't leave. And he's, he's expressed that many times that it's been so much easier not having to do it, go through that journey alone. Oh yeah, and so every twist and turn, we just continue to put our, you know, link arms, and keep just putting one foot in front of the other, and when whatever we've faced, and that has helped us more than anything over the years because, um, you know, he's um, uh, he's he's had several miracles, and we've experienced a lot, you know, near death experiences or things that mm. you know that he that he's lived through. Oh yeah. It's uh it's amazing that what he's went through and how much he has survived and how well he's doing mm -hmm. and being able to manage it. And that comes with the knowledge and learning, you know, like I didn't know you could take dialysis at home. I really didn't. And I had a brother-in-law that was on kidney dialysis for over 12 years or something like that. And, uh, you know, it was very hard on him. And this here is probably a much more uh, easier on him because uh, you know, would you would you explain a little bit or go into detail a little bit about the home dialysis, how that works for folks? Yeah. So most people, so probably like with your brother-in-law, he was probably going in three days a week in center. Yes. And yes. So, so imagine, let me put this into perspective, because a lot of people don't understand that when your kids, kidneys don't function, um, it, it, sometimes you can still urinate, but usually you get to kind of a point like, I'm just going to be frank, Raymond doesn't urinate. So... Mm -hmm. In order to get that waste and to get that out, you have to do dialysis. So it cleans the blood. It takes all of the, um, you know, it takes all the waste out. Uh, so you you gather. If you think about it, if you're not, you know, urinating, you're getting all those fluids are going into your body. Yes. The waste. And so yes. if you're going in center three days a week, you're you're t you're putting on more fluid and then you're taking it off. And you're putting on more fluid and you're taking it off. And it's really hard on your heart. Mm -hmm. um, when they come home from dialysis, they're extremely tired. Yes. I know Randy come home and he's like, I just need to take a nap. I just, I just need to sleep. I, you know, and then the next day he would be better, but it's just that over and over now, because he's doing it five days a week, you know, the fluid levels going up and down aren't as bad. So he's able to, you know, exercise four or five days a week. Like I, I'm hard pressed to keep up with him, <laughs> um, you know, but it's, he has the freedom, especially right now when it's, you know, people are in quarantine or people, you know, are socially distancing. Um, they're taking great precautions too in, in the dialysis centers. Uh, mm -hmm. But 
such a blessing to be able to do that here from home and, um, you know, be here with his family and uh, be able to participate in, in activities here at home. I imagine his body is able to adjust more to the more frequent treatments and it's not as much of a shock on his system and that overall enhances his life. How could someone, uh, if they're on kidney dialysis, how could they go about finding out how to do the home treatments, for example? Do you have, I imagine you have that information on your website, don't you? Um, yeah, absolutely. In fact, they can reach out to us. We can get them in touch with some folks. Um, Raymond is also a patient advocate with Next Stage. Um, that's the you know the device that he uses. He believes in it so much that he helps talk to other patients and you know answer some of their questions. And so um, you know they can definitely go to Next Stage as well. But um, there's there's a lot of information out there uh, about it. I would also encourage them if they're on dialysis, ask their nephrologist. Ask their, you know, when, when they're there at um, the dialysis center, you can maybe ask their nurse or, or someone there and say, hey, I, I would like to know a little bit more about some of my options at, at home. And um, I'm really happy to see that there's a big push right now to get more people to do dialysis at home. It's um, oh, yeah. so that, that's something that, you know, but even even with the, the goals that are in mind for that, unfortunately, I'm hearing they're still going to have to open up a lot of dialysis centers just because of the influx, Increased. you know, what, what, we're, what we're expecting over the next few years. And that's really where we're trying to come in and, and save people's kidneys. We, wow. we want to raise that awareness, help with prevention. Um, and our third key pillar of our organization is regenerative medicine. So we want to empower people and know that they have um, really the ability to um, really to take charge of their health, to know what questions to ask, right? To know what's going to be good, what's going to be bad, not just for their kidneys, but overall health, um, mm -hmm. what, what steps they can take so that they don't fall into these statistics, what things they can do if they do find out that they have kidney disease and mm -hmm. how they can improve their kidney function. Um, and, and we've seen that there's, um, I'll, I'll share with you one gentleman that he just, I mean, I'm, I'm in awe. He, he just blows me away. In fact, the first time you and I met when we were, when you guys were down in Phoenix mm -hmm. and, uh, Don was talking about, you know, putting together a hero story. He was my hero story. Mm. And, and, uh, when we, we've known each other for a couple of years, but last, last summer, uh, we got together and his, his wife had reached out and said, you know, can you help refer to a nephrologist? I'm like, well, what's, what's going on? And um, shared what was happening with him. And I was like, oh, my goodness. And when we talked, as he was describing things, I said, I could have told you a year ago there was something with your kidneys. And unfortunately, he was he had been hospitalized three times. He was in the ER three times. And it wasn't until his third visit that they're telling him that he's in congestive heart failure, he's ha he has, you know, kidney failure, all of these different things. And, um, you know, it was like, it just totally caught him off guard. And he was able to, you know, we, we, we met, we talked. In fact, we even had he and his wife over uh, with another couple while Raymond was doing dialysis just to talk about what, it, what does this mean? What are some of the options? And then also saying, hey, what are some of the things you can do to try and keep your kidney? What can you do now? And what are some of the changes you can make for your diet with your exercise? And he, I'm going to tell you, Jim, he jumped on it. He said, I, you know, he's, he's only in his 40s, has a wife and a young son. He goes, I want to live for them. And oh, so he, yeah. he embraced those changes. And um, when I saw him about four or five months later uh, in uh, Sprouts, you know, in the grocery store, in fact, in the, in the, in the produce aisle, um, he looked so good. I, I mean, it was, it, it just brought tears to my eyes because he was able to really turn his health around. And here we are over a year, almost, almost 18 months later, and he still has not had to start on dialysis. Wow. That's what we want to see more of. Yes. We want to yes. give people the hope to be able to learn, not, you know, he's learning about it at stage four, five, on the teetering on stage five kidney mm -hmm. failure. Wow. We want to reach the people before they even get that, but we want to get to the people at stage one, two, three, and let hopefully someone here listening today 
is hearing what I just said, that even at stage four and five, you can still do things that can make wow. a difference for your kidneys. That's that's an amazing story. I, I hadn't heard that one. And it really is. That so just gets me. It's just very inspiring because I can see where the tears would come in your eyes because I see someone that, you know, now that they're, they, you know, you know, been saddled with all this doom and gloom and all this, you know, congestive heart failure and everything. And there's so much alive. I mean, that's just, that's, that's the true blessing. And you're answering your calling in life, aren't you? Because you've been, you were handpicked for this mission. You really were. God has a sense of humor. Yes. <laughs> I believe so. <laughs> <clears throat> I'll tell you, but you know, your film is coming out and uh, do you know when that's going to be out? Your documentary? So early, early 2021. It is completed. And so we're just putting the final touches on some plans and we'll be doing the, the premiere. And then we're, we're going to have a really huge push, uh, especially in March, because March is kidney disease awareness month. But mm. stay tuned even earlier in the year. You know, we want to get this, want to get this out to people. So we'll, we'll definitely be sharing more. Yeah. I definitely want to check out your website there. One in nine kidney challenge. And that is the, <clears throat> excuse me, that's the same name you use for the Facebook page, right? Yes, it is. <clears throat> <clears throat> How often do you put, post stuff on your Facebook page, daily or? You know, not quite daily, but I, I do quite frequently and share some great stories on there, some great tips. Um, so that I do keep a little bit more up to date right now, especially because things are moving so quickly, even some different mm -hmm. regenerative medicine solutions. Um, you know, I, I definitely promote things even uh, as an example, um, just posted some things recently, like with the kidney project out of UCSF. Mm -hmm or they're working on the bio artificial kidney. So wow. there's, there's, um, yeah, there's a lot that we want to push to, to bring to the forefront a lot sooner, mm -hmm. not just for Raymond, but for the millions of people yes. that, that are. Paid. Yeah. Because helping others, I mean, that just helps you and just, it just dominoes. And that goes right into all that wonderful energy that Cheryl was staring, uh, sharing with us earlier. And I'd like to invite Cheryl back to the stage, just a, a closing comment. If we get a chance to wave goodbye to everyone, we wrap up our show. And there she is. Well, that's an inspiring story, and Annalyn shared, wasn't it? I believe you got your mic I'm off. Sorry. There. <laughs> yes, that was really beautiful, Annalyn. Thank you. I had no idea. So that I'm like, that's really great information. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. You're, you're, you're not alone. You're not alone. <laughs> Most people don't know, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Lots of prayers and blessings to your husband. Thank you. A lot of people ask me, how come this show became so popular? And they said, well, Jim, how'd you do it? Well, I didn't have anything to do with it. You're looking at two great examples right now with Anne Lynn and Cheryl. And I just want to personally thank both of you ladies for being with us today and being on the show. And my goodness gracious, you're both just a tremendous blessing uh, to, to a multitude of people out there. And I encourage you again to reach out to Cheryl. You, I'm going to put her website up there again, uh, createspacestudio.com, and be sure and visit with her. And th this young lady is, uh, she's a reverend now, so you know, be sure and uh, if she passed collection plate, put something in there, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I, I had to say that. I had to say that. I, I know I'm bad. But sincerely, I mean, she's really... Um, very well educated and she'll the sound healer that that really got me out that that's there's a lot to that so if you're if you got a lot of chaos in your life and you're looking for some rest and peace get in touch with cheryl Absolutely. And, um, and also with anna lynn because there's someone out there one in nine and the numbers are going up there's someone out there that you can reach out and help and change their life is suffer from kidney disease so please do. Ladies and gentlemen, our time is gone. I thank you so much for tuning in. We hope you have a blessed and a Merry Christmas and safe holidays. On behalf of Anna Lynn and Cheryl, we're just all going to wave goodbye. Thank you much for tuning in. Share our show with others. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.